Welcome to OUDCE's 2019 Open Day. Uh, we have the great advantage of being first in today's programme, so uh, thank you for being here so promptly and we're starting exactly on time. As you see, my name's Kate Tiller. I contribute particularly to the local and social history programmes here in the department, which cover everything from uh, day schools through to part-time DPhils, and in my time I've uh, been involved in all of those. And local and social history, I think, is one of the most accessible and satisfying ways uh, of approaching uh, history that we have. The theme I've chosen this morning, Village Life, Contrasting Communities and Histories, is uh, a theme that um, historians coming to the subject from the local perspective find particularly interesting. It's also one that provides, as many of you will know, some of the persistently powerful popular images of what English history is about, and also has a strong impact on contemporary perceptions of modern Englishness. Um, the idea of village life is often rather an homogenous one and assumes that there's some typical entity that we can all recognize and it's often isn't it um, expressed in terms of a counterpoint historically the english village epitomizes the traditional stable the innocent the ideal state of uh, society uh, and one in which you don't expect to find much conflict and perhaps rather little change or movement of people. Uh, and the co counterpoint to that is that it will be broken and overborne historically by harsher modern realities, certainly by conflicts and tensions and physical upheavals and uh, development in the countryside. And it's not just um, historically that we have that uh, rather emphatic and homogenous view of village life. I found myself, and in some ways I wish I hadn't, watching an episode of Midsummer Murders um, <laughs> the other evening. And isn't it fascinating how that and so many crime novels and stories find themselves located in rural settings and there it's using this uh, rather cliched, I would argue, view of the English village to make another counterpoint between the perverted evils of the shocking crimes uh, because they're within a seemingly beautiful, undisturbed setting, the English village. So local and social historians and other kind of historians too are keenly interested in village life, but I think looking at it more uh, deeply may be taking a longer view. And in this talk, I want to give you uh, some ideas and impressions of how historians set about researching, interpreting uh, uh, village life to get us perhaps beyond the cliches. And it's soon extremely clear that the life of villages was and is very varied, that there's no one typical truth about this. But historians do find, and will argue, as I will this morning, that there are patterns in that variety. There are types of villages. And what a village is like is not just a matter of happenstance. It reflects patterns. And there are causes and effects of those patterns. So that's the approach I'd like to take this morning. And I'm uh, going to start um, by quoting you descriptions of two villages within three miles of one another in a rural county in Lincolnshire in the east of England. Uh, and this is in a family history memoir um, by a man called Geoffrey Robinson, Headingham Harvest. The subtitle is Victorian Family Life in Rural England. And members of Robinson's family uh, had lived in each of these two three miles apart villages, which are called Redbourne and Headingham, 
he calls it Headingham in the book because some of what he, he uncovers in his family history is a little risque and he thinks that the 20th century, this was published this book in 1977, 20th century residents of Headingham would rather that the wider world didn't know that it's really Waddingham if you ever go to Lincolnshire. But here is from his own family's experience, because Robinson, just think about it, writing this in 1977, had a direct line to Lake Victorian and Edwardian village life through his grandfather and his uncles. So first of all, let's go to uh, Redbourne. Redbourne was a village entirely unlike Headingham. Redbourne was shrouded in trees for no one but the Duke, the Duke of St Albans. The Duke had authority to cut them down. Every house and cottage was built of stone in a consistent architectural style, and most of them carried the scenarial arms. The school was approached <coughs> through a Gothic stone archway, and the blacksmith's shop, shown here, let to my great-grandfather looked like a Greek temple. The portico was a colonnade of pillars surmounted by a triangular pediment with a large white stallion carved in wood mounted on the apex. The horse was rearing on its hind legs with four feet pawing the air as if stung by a hornet. Then, just up the road, the main gates to the mansion were set in a stone archway flanked by a pair of identical lodge houses, presenting a total facade designed to repel invaders with cruciform <laughs> embrasures for archers and battlements uh, overhead for other defenders. Splendours of that kind uh, and the particularly charming jeu d'esprit of the blacksmith shop made Redbourne a very beautiful village and it was kept so because the Duke owned every building in it except the church and the rectory and he owned them too in the sense that he had the right of presentation to the benefits. So everyone said yes your grace and no your grace and men touched their forelocks, and the women and children did curtsy bobs. Henry, who is the author's uncle, often walked over from Headingham to visit his grandfather, and if he was outside the blacksmith shop, if he was outside the um, blacksmith shop when the sound of a coaching horn was heard, Thomas Milson would push him indoors because it heralded the approach of the Duke in his coach and four, with outriders in front and footmen standing up behind, one of them blowing the horn. Henry, the young lad, is spared the dignity of touching his forelock, but Thomas's tenancy depended on his staying outside and making the gesture of subservience. Mr. Harrison, the hated rector, expected the same deference. And there was a tale of a joiner who in the time of the ninth duke went to live in Redbourne, but whose wife refused to curtsy to the rector. The rector complained to the duke, who summoned the joiner to see him. The man said that his wife did as she pleased and he could not control her genuflections. <laughs> so the duke had a word with a woman, who not only flatly refused, you can see what's coming, who not only flatly refused to curtsy to the rector, but to the duke as well. She would, she said, only bow her knee to her maker. This religious zeal commended itself no more to the duke than it did to the rector. <laughs> and the joiner was obliged to take his family and his stiff leg wife out of the village again because the duke owned the roof over his head and the roof over the head of everyone who might give him employment as a joiner. So that is what local and social historians call um, all the features of a, a closed or a state village. And then, if we go our three miles uh, to Headingham, a.k.a. Waddingham, uh, we find this, and Robinson describes uh, this village, which, as you can see, uh, is decidedly less picturesque. Um, rather mean, mixed housing characteristic of Waddingham in this way. And he censored it all on the kind of people 
that lived in this contrasting village. Andersons and Kirby's had intermarried with each other for generations, and with Maitlands, Hiles, Rudkins and Atkinsons. Consequently, practically all the farmers and master craftsmen in Headingham were closely enough related to my grandfather to be regarded as his cousins, and that's how they sometimes addressed each other. Henry was able to call at least a dozen men in the village uncle, and these men and their families constituted an interrelated group of rural bourgeoisie with a well-defined sense of hierarchy. So a completely different social structure from Redbourne. Freehold farmers in Waddingham were at the top and self-employed artisans were at the bottom. There was no place within this hierarchy for a labourer, nor for a journeyman who worked for a master other than his own father. Body servants were utterly beyond the pale. A younger son of these Headingham families would have died rather than becoming a footman, and he would for shame leave the village to work elsewhere if he had to work for a wage. It was villages in East Anglia, Robinson asserts, like Headingham, that bred Cromwell's Ironsides, social independence. Um, On the other hand, the social structure and the diversity of land ownership did not make for a pretty village. And this is a, a late 20th century picture of Waddingham. Trees had been cut down because they shaded cottage gardens. There were no stately avenues laid through the village on their way to neoclassical gatehouses. Everyone had built as he liked, and the houses in the village street observed neither a common architectural style nor a building line. They were like a very irregular row of teeth, some forward, some backward, some missing, and all different. So I think that uh, very clearly makes the point about the variety of villages. And this is what social and local historians would call all the signs of an open village. So open and closed is the typology uh, that is very typically used. Now this isn't just one of those constructs of latter-day people like me, 20th and 21st century social historians wanting to label and categorise. It's something that contemporaries, as well as Robinson's uh, family members, saw. Uh, Official observers, like the Assistant Commissioner of the Royal Parliamentary Royal Commission on the Employment of Children, etc., in the 1860s, he came to Oxfordshire and he describes this system of different villages on the ground. Deddington, some of you may know, a a large village in North Oxfordshire, with its hamlets is an open parish into which labourers have been driven from surrounding closed parishes. And then in Deddington, about 240 cottages belonging to about 50 owners, the three largest estates approaching 300 acres, each not being represented by any cottages. So it's this very dispersed uh, flat structure um, of of ownership with no dominant uh, landowner over the lot. Several of the cottages in Denton proper are very bad. In Grove Lane, commonly called Hell Lane, are seven or eight houses with no back door, a sink in front of the cottages and one water closet for the lot. The whole place has a horrid stench. Rent of these cottages one shilling and tuppence a week. They belong to small tenement holders. The inspector of nuisances certainly does not do his duty. Now that quickly explodes the myth that country life was idyllic and uh, the physical environment and standards of living in the countryside must have been healthier and better than in the towns. They were not, of course, bad on the scale that they were in towns, but in fact, uh, country life could be very impoverished and the, the smell and the look and the social character of an open village such as Deddington uh, would be uh, very different from your closed estate village. The other thing you'll have noticed is the proactive verb that the assistant commissioner used. Labourers have been driven from surrounding closed parishes. And this is the idea which is strongly borne out by the contemporary evidence that the different villages didn't just happen. 
if you uh, were resident uh, in a village, uh, that place was responsible for poor relief and poor rates uh, for those who fell on hard times. So control of housing supply in a closed village, you can see where this is going, uh, was one way also uh, of controlling uh, expenditure as well as social tone and environmental issues and so on. And the open communities were the, um, the pools of um, affordable housing uh, and often had a labour surplus. More people lived there than could get jobs in a particular open village, but they went and worked in surrounding closed villages. So the interaction between the village types as well as the contrast uh, socially and economically is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. And so modern historians have taken up this evidence and uh, further defined and refined and developed that open and closed uh, uh, dichotomy. This is the work of uh, Dennis Mills and he describes the characteristics um, so open villages are the larger ones with high population densities. They tend to grow more rapidly. Uh, many small proprietors, what Mills calls peasant families, I'll come back to that, uh, mm. small farms, high poor rates, uh, a lot of rural industry and independent artisans as compared with closed villages, mm. a variety of shops and pubs, um, housing poor but plentiful, religious nonconformity, more chapels, radicalism and independence strong in politics and social organisation. And Dennis Mills, who I know, always tells me this was a joke on his part, but it's got into all the books like mine, <laughs> poachers as opposed to gamekeepers. Um, but I won't read out the, the contrary, but I think you're getting a, a picture now uh, of, of the, uh, uh, the two types. Um, the historians are going beyond um, purely describing the differences but suggesting there are causes for this and the most commonly used for many years amongst historians is to say it all stems from land ownership you know if you've got a dominant big house uh, active estate economy uh, dominating uh, your rural village or villages then they will take on that uh, uh, estate appearance. If you've got this much more dispersed um, uh, land ownership, lack of control over rights of settlement, higher poor rates, um, it's, it's that land equals power uh, correlation that uh, drives it all. And this is the work of Brian Short, a historical geographer, who has sought to assert those causal links. Would you believe that imposing a model like this on human societies in the English countryside doesn't always find a neat fit? Um, so for example, um, one of the classic studies is of Castle Acre, which is a, a small or a market town almost in Norfolk, which is in the middle of the Earls of Leicester system. And the Earls of Leicester, you know Holcomb, some of you may have visited the Great House uh, that family owned 97% of property in the mid-19th century in Castle Acre. But it was a very open place because those landlords did not choose to um, take up the power and assert it directly in the way that would make for a clo uh, closed uh, community. Rather, they, uh, their estate villages were elsewhere and they were some of the people who benefited from the cheap labour that could be drawn from a place like Castle Acre to uh, their surrounding villages. So um, I and other historians are not telling you that every village you look at will be either open or closed, uh, and uh, that uh, indicators like land, land ownership and how much is spent on uh, poor relief, <laughs> uh, how diverse economic opportunities um, activity is, uh, how big the population is, these are indicative, uh, but um, not, uh, not saying that they're deterministic, 
in character. They're things to look out for. And Mills himself, who produced that very helpful list we're just looking at, he does talk of two systems. He calls the peasant or family farm um, type of village at one end, and the estate, which some historians would call capitalist farms, family farms, capitalist farms, at the other. But he admits it's a spectrum. And in the middle, for example, if you've got an absentee landlord, they may dominate the land ownership, but it won't look quite so black and white. So with that sort of framework of ideas, um, what I'd like to do um, for the remainder of, of the talk is actually illustrate some individual um, uh, villages uh, and see how some of these factors play out uh, on the ground. And I hope that might resonate with examples you know and also get you thinking about how useful you think my open close model is. You will be able to spot the difference on the ground. So this is Bloxham in North Oxfordshire, and it's complete higgledy-piggledy, as opposed to building lines and different periods of building, uh, cheap by jowl. And that uh, speaks, as we've heard, of the lack of co uh, concentrated um, control over property uh, and building. The contrast would be with an estate village like this. This is Cheney's in Bedfordshire, and it's the Dukes of Bedford uh, exercising their mid-Victorian control, uh, not just in the housing, uh, but in the landscaping, and in certain sort of public philanthropic gestures, uh, like schools, water supply, and so on. Um, on the whole, it's estate villages, um, closed villages, that often get the most attention because they're the most obvious to pick, aren't they? Open villages, it's perhaps a little more slippery to define. And so I thought I would start with open um, uh, villages. Uh, or rural settlements, it may be hamlets, as in this case. And I'm not sure whether I've got a pointer that's working, let me just check. No, I'm just going to have to point. Uh, this is a late, late 18th century map of North Oxfordshire. And can you see Juniper Hill? Uh, that is the real name of Lark Rise, which um, many of you uh, will have, uh, have come across and would very emphatically, I argue, fall into the classic open rural community. Uh, end of the uh, spectrum. It's in fact a small place, um, but you can see from this um, map, it's within Cottesford uh, Parish. Cottesford is where the land ownership, the direct control, the deferential social hierarchy is. Juniper Hill is a good example of openness growing up in sorts of places that are away uh, from the presence. And also in this case, it's Heathland. It was unimprovable. It was not closely um, uh, regulated or improved until the 1850s when it was enclosed. So at this stage, there isn't even um, a proper road um, uh, to uh, Juniper Hill. And then in the 1850s, uh, we get uh, enclosure into arable agricultural improvement and building of more cottages in what is uh, the hamlet of the Juniper Hill, classic in parliamentary enclosure road uh, here. And of course, we all know of this uh, through uh, Flora Thompson's Lark Rise to Candleford. And her descriptions of Juniper Hill, aka Lark Rise, strike me as archetypically um, uh, those of an open uh, community. Uh, the first charge on the labour's ten shillings, so this is the low pay nature of village life for many people, first charge was house rent. 
most of the cottages belong to small tradesmen in the market town, that's Brackley. And weekly rents range from one shilling to half a crown. Some labourers in other villages worked on farms or estates where they had their cottages rent free. But the hamlet people did not envy them, for, stands to reason, they said, they always got to do just what they be told, or out they goes neck and crop, bag and baggage. <laughs> a shilling or even two shillings a week, they felt, was not too much to pay for the freedom to live and vote as they liked and go to church or chapel or neither as they preferred. Um, many open communities tend to be larger villages and not to be in a particular kind of terrain like Juniper Hill, but often to have a very long built up social character um, and a, a very emphatic 19th and I would argue into the 20th century social character as open communities. And one such um, that I've studied is Hook Norton uh, in uh, North Oxfordshire, uh, and we see it here in um, 1881. I'm just going to run through a quick sequence of images of, of Hook Norton to give you the flavour and some of the indicative features that mark its openness. Um, you can see it's pretty uh, straggling, very little sign of imposed planning in its village form, and it follows either side of a valley of a stream. These are um, interwar photographs, I think this is in the 1920s one, from the top of the church tower in, in the centre of the village. Uh, and you can see at the far end the tower of Hook Norton Brewery, which is how many people uh, sort of uh, characterise the, uh, the village, the rather famous brewery. And you can see that it's, it's got um, uh, numbers of uh, vernacular buildings of the 16th and 17th century, uh, a rather broad-based farming and craft uh, economy from that period. There is here something that looks terribly like a Coxwell Manor House, and was called the Manor House, but beware the names of properties. Some of you mm -hmm. are nodding, I think. If you do local history, will you find that people adopt new names and, and often more grandiose names for their properties relatively late? And in fact, there wasn't um, an active memorial centre because Wood Norton had a very long history of absentee lordship. And I think that's helped put a particular stamp on its character as a village. But that, that is called uh, uh, the manor. And then looking the other way from the uh, church tower, we're looking down on one of the many pubs. Uh, some closed villages had no pubs, or if they had a pub at all, it was named, you know, it was the Bedford Arms or whatever. Not so Hook Morton which had looked down That was its smithy. Interestingly, the Dillapole family, who were one of the great families of 14th and 15th century England, uh, had property in Hook Norton in 15th century. In the 1430s, they tried to get a market charter and make it into uh, a, a proto-town, uh, but it never took, and that's somehow typical of Hook Norton. And then in the background, you can perhaps just see near the top of the photograph a viaduct, and that is the railway, the Banbury Cheltenham Railway of 1887. Again, it's a bit of a cliche uh, in uh, uh, discerning local history uh, that if the railway comes at any point in the 19th century, it must have promoted growth and prosperity. That line was not open until 1887. And it did bring some prosperity, as we'll see in a moment, but it also took things away, notably people who had to emigrate from a village like this in the harsh days for English agriculture that came in the 1870s onwards. So again, don't sort of automatically assume railway equals growth prosperity. It has the higgledy piggledy building um, lines um, here on South Green uh, of an open village 
it has the family farms uh, on the main street through the village that serve the large open fields all around until the enclosure of the 1770s. Its population uh, has this rapid growth. These are two, Hooklaw and Benson, two open villages in Oxfordshire that I was comparing. But you can see this rapid growth to uh, the 1850s or 60s. Then a tendency for fortunes to fall away. And then, unlike Benson, Hooklaw managed a little bit of a a recovery. How was that? Um, it had really quite a lot of commercial activity. Um, this is the central shop. That was what advertising was like in 1911. <laughs> and this is a delivery cart for local ironmongers. And if you look at the directories for villages like this, you will see the diversity of the shops. And you will also see that they served a hierarchy of smaller villages round and about. Um, this is the ironmonger from Hook Norton and his delivery service to surrounding villages. So open villages tended to have that sort of position in the hierarchy. Um, we're looking down on the church now. Can you see the difference between the nave and the chancel of the church? And that's indicative of another factor that I think paradoxically makes for openness. Um, this was um, a royal property until the conquest, when it was given to Robert Doyley, who was one of the uh, top Norman incomers uh, in, um, in Oxfordshire, who in turn gave it to Owsley Abbey here in Oxford in the 12th century. Uh, who they appropriated the living, they became the rectors, but they were absentee, of course, they had estates all over. And they were supposed to provide the clergyman, um, the vicar. The parish looks after the, the nave, and you can see how it grew in the 14th and 15th century. But the chancel, which is Owens' responsibility, is still Romanesque. It was just left. And this is, in built form, is, your, is one of your pieces of evidence of the lack of impact of an absentee lordship. So you might look at the history and think, wow, you know, there's a, a big thing here in that being all a secular lordship. But in fact, if it was in this sort of framework, um, it didn't um, uh, have the effect you might expect. In fact, rather the reverse because of the absenteeism. And so what Hook Norton has uh, it, in the 19th and the 20th century was a large number of chapels, of which is, this is one of the oldest, the Baptists. One of the key, key arenas for the um, 19th century village life working out its patterns is how the schooling is provided. Uh, this is um, the Anglo-Catholic parish of Freeland, which was a closed estate village, and, and that's their school class. This is the, um, the school at Hook Norton, and this is the parson, who in the 19th century was very much trying to counter the parallel separate provision uh, of the nonconformists. Uh, uh, and so that, that rather entertaining conflict that I mm -hmm. can't go into any further today is... Uh, is a little signal of openness, I think. And then the reason that Hooky even had a bit of a recovery of its population at the end of the 19th century was its economic diversity, and that was added to. So there's the famous brewery founded in, in the 1850s onwards by a local farmer, and it provided alternative jobs, and here are the workforce. And then the railway made it worthwhile uh, from the late 1880s onwards, opening up the ironstone workings. Uh, and here they are. And here is the Cardiff Express going through um, the Hook Norton railway station. So there was there a, a, a positive injection uh, of um, new enterprise into the open village. 
One of the tools you can imagine if you're interested in, in uh, historical sources for English history that we can use for this are the wonderful decennial census returns that itemise uh, not, not only the number but the individual circumstances of the total population of these places. And one way I and others have looked at it is to see whether a village has a labour surplus. That is to say, more people described as agricultural labour or other agricultural jobs uh, than there are uh, jobs for on, on the parish farms, or whether they, there's a labour deficit. And if open and closed works, the estate villages are going to have labour deficits, yeah? and the open villages are more likely to have a labour surface. Um, that one there with the large pink uh, surplus uh, uh, symbol, uh, that is, uh, is hit more. Um, I'm going to finish uh, by just talking for a few minutes about how some of these characteristics may have uh, persisted into the 20th century and even be discernible as you go around Oxford and other rural areas today. Uh, just a quick straw poll. How, how many of you here think you could still pick open from closed villages in the countryside today? Yeah, that's, thank you, that's, that's very in interesting and I, I would say there's, a, there's quite a body of opinion that thinks this is still to be seen. After the 1870s, a mixture of factors, including free trade importation of cheap agricultural produce, growing um, urban um, uh, demand, uh, poverty in the countryside, made for tough times for the agricultural sector. Uh, agricultural depression, uh, much better times for urban dwellers. And this is Hook North in the 1920s. And today our villages are so pristine and tarted up <laughs> and perfect when I'm talking about the quality of the housing. Then there was the general mood of decay. How would your estate village or your open village uh, sustain itself? Uh, uh, through this. And we do see that in the early 20th century, Hook Norton's population is declining. But you can see what begins to happen later, post war, in the 20th century. And here is the injection of large amounts of new development for people living in Hook Norton but working elsewhere. One of the legacies of open and closed that's argued is that it's the open villages which have seen the most um, uh, modern development. So one of the uh, things that would sustain uh, this open and closed is whether the old estate economy and the old paternalist interventionism of landowners work. If you had a big house family this is from Strathfield Say, the Dukes of Wellington's house. This is a member of the Wellesley family with her uh, perfect mid-Victorian children. Uh, and families like this could be enormously influential drivers uh, through social, religious, moral, to our eyes, social engineering uh, views of what they should do for their villages. But the economic base of their estate economies was being knocked by the same agricultural depression that I just mentioned. Was the estate village sustainable? Well, there's always the phenomenon in English rural life of new wealth coming in and making, giving itself status um, uh, by um, choosing to have a country house and an estate. And this is from Wadston in Buckinghamshire, which was one of several places uh, that were brought up by the Rothschild banking family in the <coughs> later 19th century. And this is two local children 
uh, campaigning for the, Lo the Wadston Rothschild for his election as a Liberal MP in January 1906. But do you see what the slogans are? Old age pensions and poor law reform. This is the, one of the turning points in the 20th century development uh, of the beginnings of collectivism, state intervention, moving towards the uh, welfare state. Something that is ultimately going to uh, supersede the earlier assumptions of coping through paternalism, the sort of you know, estate economy and social relationships we've been talking about. But slightly ironically, we've got the Rothschilds taking up uh, the estate village idea and being very uh, paternalist uh, landowners, involving themselves very directly in liberal politics uh, and being caught up um, in, um, in the development of, of um, state welfare. But equally, this picture tells us about control and influence, doesn't it? I, I don't know if you think it tells us about deference. <laughs> um, so there are places where the estate economy continues, probably not because it was economically viable, but because the people operating it had money or resources from elsewhere, or were so imbued with the noblesse oblige idea that they should continue that traditional role. But in some places, you do get unexpected alternatives coming in uh, to um, the uh, traditional underpinnings of uh, estate villages. This is Philkins in West Oxfordshire. And in the 1930s in particular, uh, that village developed, uh, was provided with all manner of community facilities uh, and enhancements. This is the Bowling Green. And the source of that is perhaps unexpected. Uh, and this is two members of the Swinford family who were a local, long established uh, family. But the driver of this seems to be Sir Stafford Cripps. Does that name resonate with some of you? The uh, Labour Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, leading national um, politician, as of course was George Lansbury, sitting here in 1935 at the opening of the new village centre um, in um, Philpins. And he a great figure in London um, and national politics. And this is from the preceding year in Philpins, 1934, uh, the Methodist Church sale public tea and demonstration. And um, public tea uh, in uh, somebody's garden, isn't it? Right yeah, uh, at Goodfellows Philpins, by the most kind invitation of Sir Stafford and Lady Cripps. So the sort of paternalist. Um, uh, keeping going elements uh, of, uh, of these traditional village occasions and relationships is still there. <coughs> and so, like you, uh, by your show of hands, I would agree that if you look at the countryside today, um, as I did in this article in 2007, you will find these contrasting villages in the contemporary landscape. And a classic mid Oxfordshire example is Sanford St. Martin, which is the home farm, school, church, and big house of the estate, and cheap by jowl, with a sort of complementary, perhaps, uh, open village, Middle Barton. And if you look at house prices, if you're researching, looking local press and so on for house prices at different periods, the contrasts. Um, are, are another more contemporary indicator of the, um, uh, the difference. And post-Second World War, and this is my, my finishing uh, period now, post-Second World War, uh, the argument might be that one of the 
factors other than the paternalism, the estate economy, some of the other things we've talked about, the different local employment patterns and so on. The big influences are shifting perhaps to more external ones and the post-war planning system is um, a very major thing there. This is from the Historical Atlas of Oxfordshire, which um, I have assumed in 2010, and we were very keen to have an essay and a map on the planning. Uh, and here uh, you see uh, the, uh, the Green Belt, the ANOBs, uh, the whole business of listing and conservation and preservation. But the other thing you see here is post-war from the late 40s, 50s onwards, structure planning. And in Oxfordshire and elsewhere, that designated particular villages um, for <coughs> development, not just housing development, but concentration of what are now public services. And guess where, Deddington and Broughton are amongst those designated villages. These were the larger, perhaps more media public service uh, places. They got uh, libraries, fire stations, um, uh, a new school premises, um, uh, more housing. Um, and there is a, a sort of um, a, a some deg degree of um, uh, synchronicity between those factors uh, at, at work. And so an example of, of this kind of planning intervention, village enhancement, which goes even further here, is the creation of new settlements. And I end with Berinsfield, which some of you may know in South Oxfordshire near to Dorchester. And this is the Municipal Journal of 1960. Bullingdon Rural District Council is creating um, a, uh, a new village. And we've been talking about historians analysing, uh, collecting evidence and analysing and uh, uh, looking at typologies. Sociologists are big on this. And for this post-Second World War period, in the case of Berensfield, um, Morris and Mogi's book on, on Berensfield and housing, the sociologists have really got into this business of, uh, of rural communities. We're talking at Berensfield, uh, a disused Second World War airfield uh, where the USAF uh, had been, uh, and it became known as Mount Farm. And the wonderful suite of photographs of the conditions there. There were absolutely chronic housing difficulties in towns and rural areas post Second World War. <coughs> and uh, these are the ex USAF huts. And people were squatting uh, in, in these. And then there is the in intervention to create this as a new settlement, a new area of public housing. And here are the remaining huts. The order in which families were really housed, this is Morris and Mogis tagging their book on Berenson. So it was vital to them because the award of the new house is a highly valued privilege. And there are the new council houses going up. And this is my final. Uh, image. What Morris and Mogi did was not only trace the genesis of, of the redevelopment uh, of what a um, t mid 20th century new village would look like, and it had a new church, a new school, shops, a recreation ground, a boxing club, uh, amongst other things. Is how did it gel? How did it form a community? Uh, and here we have the Church of England, who built a new church in 1962, seeking to bring the <coughs> ministry to the people. 
and it says since only the children accept the church as their abandonment becomes a sign of maturity and their function is limited to early years socialization <laughs> so that absolutely epitomizes the way that that conceptualization by mid 20th century sociologists of a new Oxfordshire village is, is a fascinating coming together of cultures I, I'm not going to pontificate on wh where you think a place like Beringsfield sits in the typology um, of rural settlements and, and communities it has a certain reputation um, in, in uh, uh, Oxfordshire but um, I hope that you have found these sort of perspectives on um, uh, village contrasts and how historians and we as in interested uh, present day observers might look at them. I hope you find them interesting and provoking uh, and uh, that uh, you may like to pursue your studies perhaps through some of our courses, but I'll stop at that. Thank you.